on being prepared. The signs say that we need to get ready if we're not ready to be prepared for what is about to take place. And God has told us that the signs have a purpose. Now I realize that as believers this morning, we're not to live our life by signs, we're to live our life by faith. But signs are a milepost to us. Signs are beneficial to all of us. And the Bible teaches this. Signs does speak a language. And what we think of today and what is happening, the signs that's going on in the world today and the signs that we're seeing in the families today, even in the churches, they're signs that tells us that we need to be prepared uh, because we need to get ready because there's some things coming and it's going to come fast. But as I speak of signs, and I'm just going to try, try to use this as a little bit of, of introduction this morning, that signs are important and they have their role in our life. If you And it goes back to the beginning. If you'll go back to Genesis chapter 1, and I want you to read this morning, verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. This was God in his creative act. And God said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. When we see the sun come up, that's a sign of what God has done. When we see the sun set and the moon comes up, that's a sign of what God has done. When we see the fall of the year that is coming, we see it's a sign that God has put in place. When we see wintertime coming, it's a sign that God has shown us. And the spring, all of it are signs. In Isaiah, if you'll turn there with me to Isaiah chapter 7. I want to read to you here in verse 14. Isaiah. We'll get to it here in a minute. Isaiah 7. Verse 14. Now, when we, when we look at this, I think that we need to... Understand that God himself is giving a sign here. He asked uh, Ahaz, the uh, king, to give him a sign. And Ahaz said, I wouldn't do that. I'm not going to do that. Well, God said, I'm going to give you a sign. And it's a sign for the whole world. And look what it said in verse 4. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Turn with me now as far as this sign goes, and I want you to turn over with me to Matthew. And I want you to look at me in Matthew chapter 1. And I want you to look at what the Bible says here. Matthew chapter 1. Verses 20 through 23. But while he thought on these things, as were Joseph, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. 
Now we find here in Matthew the sign that was given in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. We find that this sign then was made real. There was a sign in Isaiah 7 14 that was designed for us to see the milepost of time. Now look with me, if you will, in another scripture that I'd like to share with you this morning. And it's found over in Luke. And it's in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Now we know the story of the birth of Christ. And we know that the wise men or, or the uh, shepherds were out on the hillside. And we know that the angels visited them. And they give some instructions. They told them to go there to Bethlehem. And then let's look reading in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Now I want to stop here and tell you that him being wrapped in swaddling clothes was not the sign that the shepherds were looking for. They were looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. They were looking for the baby that had been prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And it said, And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find... And, and, but you put that with verse 11... And in the latter part of verse 12, and said, here's how you'll find him. He'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes. But all newborn babies back then were wrapped in, they were wrapped in clothes. And so here I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is the sign. Then, and he's the sign now. And as we look at this in being prepared, we want to talk about some of the signs today that I believe are very, very important. Now, there's three signs that I think that we need to pay close attention to this morning. The first sign is, you would say, in your mind, uh, maybe you would say that the first sign then would be about Christ. But I would say to you that the first sign not the one we're going to talk about today, but the very first sign was the creation, where God put his signature on creation. Now, always remember about these signs. They always have to have a beginning, and the beginning was with creation. But that's not the three signs that we're going to be talking about. But those are the three, uh, the three that I want us to dwell upon follow, number one, the creation. So then, the, okay, the, the one I want us to see today is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one that I want us to focus upon this morning. But being prepared. Being prepared for the coming events. And the Lord Jesus Christ is playing a role in the coming events that's going to take place. You see, when I used to go to the movies years and years ago as a little boy, they would all have the previews of the coming events. And now they put out on the news that they're going to be an I, a new iPhone coming out. Are they going to be a new computer coming? Those are the coming events. And everybody's waiting in line to get one of those uh, Apple iPhones, I guess. Or those gadgets that we have today. Everybody waits in line. It's a coming event. And so that's what they're wanting. So the coming events should be something that we prepare for. Now, I want to read some more scripture this morning. And I want us to go back to Proverbs. Go back to Proverbs, and we'll read beginning in 
verse 15, or chapter 15, verses 28 through 33. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think about what's taking place around us. The events that's happening today. And how are we dealing with them? How are we prepared for what we see taking place today? So in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28, listen to what the Bible said. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Now, he's telling us here that the heart of the righteous, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, they study to answer. In other words, we're trying to figure out what's taking place today. We're trying to, to figure it out and be reasonable about it and to understand where all of this sin and all of this activity is originating from. But the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. They will look for the wrong answers. They will not look for the godly answers. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayers of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoice, the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instructions despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproveth, getting understanding. The fear of the Lord is instructions of wisdom. And before honor is humility. Now look in chapter 16. And let's look at verses 1 through 3. The preparation of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is far from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirit. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. He's simply telling us here, to be prepared, we need the thoughts of the Lord. To be prepared for what is coming and what is going on in this world today, we need to be very wise in how we respond. We need to be people who has meditated upon the truth and upon God's word. And we need to understand what preparation means. And we ought to look at the signs and let that be milepost that tells us where we're at in life and how we're going to progress as we go further. Now I want us to look at some more scripture. Now look with me in Amos, if you will. Amos in the Old Testament. Now here in Amos, I want you to look in chapter 4. And I want to begin reading uh, here. In verses 7 through 13. Now listen at the scripture. And also I have withholden the rain from you. When there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city. And caused it to not to rain upon another city. And one piece was rained upon. And the piece were on. It rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the Palmer worm devoured them, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword. And I have taken away your horses, and I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. 
I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thoughts, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Here in Amos, we find that God was saying through Amos, I have done so many things to bring hardships upon you, to try to get you to return to me. I have tried to get you to see by withholding the rain in one city and giving the rain to another city that you might see the blessings and the judgment and know the difference that you might turn to me. He goes on and he talks about those things that he did in hopes that Israel would return to him. But they would not. And so he said, prepare to meet thy God in judgment. The God who created everything. This morning we see in Texas, God allowed tragedy to take place. We see in Ohio, God has allowed tragedy to take place. We see all over the world that God is in various places is allowing some to prosper and some to suffer. But God is trying to get us to see that there is a difference when he allows judgment to fall and when he gives grace. How many people are thankful this morning? That you're here. And it didn't happen to you. How many of us even give us that. Any thought to that. That how good God was to us. To withhold. Those things that happened. In El Paso. And in Cincinnati. And in Los Angeles. In various places all over the world. You see God wants us. To prepare to meet him. He wants us to understand that there is a difference between the judgment and the wrath of God. And the blessings of God. You say. Are you saying that what happened in Texas. Was the, was the judgment of God. I will tell you what happened in Texas and what happened in Cincinnati was God withdrew with grace. He allowed it to happen. He didn't tell the guy to go in and shoot nobody. But he removed his hand of grace. He pulled it back just like he did in the World Trade Center buildings. He didn't tell those men to attack that building, but he pulled back his hand of grace that those men could do those awful things. And God is saying to all of us, prepare to meet thy God. I'm get, trying to get you to see. These are signs that I want you to see. These are signs that I want you to take heed to. That you might understand me is what the Lord is saying. So this morning. For the first one, and we'll be preaching on these for three Sundays in a row, Lord willing. But the first one we're going to be preaching on is the first sign of the birth of Christ. The birth of Jesus. That's the way the term needs to be. The birth of Jesus. That was his human name. The birth of Jesus speaks of the sign of redemption. Now, I would say to you this morning that the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was the most important event that took place 
while Jesus was upon this earth. And you would say, I beg to differ, yeah, the cross is where he made the biggest. That was the biggest event. But you must understand, if there had not been no Bethlehem, if there had not been no birth of Christ, if, or Jesus, if there had not have been a God in heaven who came to this earth and put on flesh, there would have been no cross. And there would have been no tomb. It all began in redemption when Jesus settled in the womb of Mary. And we can look at that as just a Christmas story. Or we can look at that as the beginning of redemption. Because without that, there would not have been any redemption. He, he did not just come and as a man go to the cross and die. But he came as a babe to give us small post signs that we might understand the great act of redemption. Thank God. That's prepared for us. And today, those signs, we need to trace them. And that's what I want to try to do. To give you some interesting, uh, some thoughts about it, the coming way. The birth of Jesus today in redemption is what we're preaching upon. Next Sunday, the Lord willing, we will be preaching upon the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is different. That is the day of the rapture. That's what we're looking for. And the third one, and the third message, will be the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment. But this morning, let's stay with the birth of Jesus Christ. Because that's, that's the one that we're living in. The rapture of the church is what we're looking for. But we're living in the hour of redemption. We're living in that moment of grace. There's a huge difference in all three of them. A huge difference. And we need to understand, and I hope that but through the three messages you will learn the difference. Let's go back now. And let's look at the beginning. And let's go back and try to find the path that led to the birth of Jesus. Let's try to go back and follow the path that brought us redemption. In that path, was there mile post? Yes. In that, in that path, was there things that God wants us to see and to understand? Yes. The path that we will speak about, I will call them stepping stones. The stepping stones of the life of redemption for Jesus. Just like our life is a life of stepping stones. Those signs. We have a little baby. The first sign we look for is to see that little baby sit up. The next sign we look for is that little baby to begin to crawl. And then we look for the next sign for that little baby to begin to try to walk. And then the next sign we look for is trouble. Because once they learn how to walk, we're in trouble. So we prepare ourselves for that sign. By putting everything else so high that the children can't reach them. Right? Y'all moved stuff, didn't you? Maybe you didn't. But let's look at the path of stepping stones. And let us, let us think about that. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We won't have time to go back and read them all. But I want you to look in Genesis 3.15. You know that scripture. 
Adam had failed and Adam had sinned. And here's God's answer. And he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know what this verse of Scripture is? These are the beginning posts of the path. What does a surveyor do when he surveys land? He has a starting point. And he will find that starting point and he will drive a stake in. And say, this is where that everything will operate from. They'll get all their degrees, get all their directions from that post that they find is a starting point. This is God's starting point. This is the post that he drove in. This, this was the uncut line. This was the line, that, the, the path that had not been laid yet. But here's where it's going to start. Here's where the stepping stone starts. So what does he tell us? He says that we are to be careful. Because I find that he said in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 8. I'll not turn there, but he said, Beware. Beware that Christ does not become a stumbling stone. One that will cause you to trip over it. One that will cause you to fall. That's how we're prepared in our walk with Christ. In Genesis 3.15 then, the path was marked out. And the cornerstone was laid. So let's look at the length of this path. This is interesting. The length of this path will go from Genesis 3.15 to Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15. You know what happens there in the Revelations 20, verses 7 through 15. Satan and the false prophet are destroyed. You know what happened in Genesis 3, 15? A war began between Jesus and Satan. But I want you to know something. It's three words that describes this. The length of this path. That goes all the way through the Bible. It was designed in such a way that we could prepare to meet Him. It was designed so that you and I could see the milepost in life, that we could understand what milepost we were in in life. And this one, and it's the most uh, most important thing, is that we understand where we're at. On this path. And what milepost we're at. Or whether you are stumbling. Whether the message of Christ has caused you to stumble. And if you're here lost today. And you don't know Christ. You're stumbling. You're falling. You don't see the milepost. You don't see the path. But it's designed. That we might see and understand. It's distance. It's to give all humanity. An opportunity. It's determination. It's determination. Think of that. Design. The distance. And the determination. When Christ Jesus, when he was born in Mary's womb and he was, came forth, he was determined to do what? To go to the cross. He was determined that he would pave the way, that we could use him, his birth, his death, 
in his resurrection as a milepost to prepare us to meet our God. So then, let's look as we find the path begin. Look with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Unto Adam also, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. The first stone that was laid in the path was the stone of death. The stone of death. Up until this point, there had been nothing that ever died physically. But God killed an animal here that he might clothe Adam and Eve. So then, death is a milepost. A milepost that was marked out that would affect Jesus but it would also affect you and I. But notice this animal. Notice this, I believe, a lamb. He did not say. But notice the blood that had been shed here. Bloodshed. The first stone that was laid indicated that the death of Christ it indicated the blood of Christ that would flow from the cross. A milepost for you and I. This death here was innocent for the guilty. This lamb that died just outside the Garden of Eden was an innocent lamb that had to be the first to die because of sin. The innocent lamb that died for the guilty. You see, this is a milepost. This is a this puts us on the path toward Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was the one who shed his blood. It was Jesus who was innocent but dying for the guilty. But notice he took and he put this clothing, these skins of an Adam and Eve. He clothed them in his righteous garment. You know why? So that Adam and Eve could have fellowship with him. It was a covering. Not permanent, but a covering. Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you and I. That we might be clothed in his righteousness. His righteousness forevermore. Evermore. I want to tell you this morning, I'm wearing the righteousness of Christ. I can stain it by my sins. But I, I'll tell you, it'll never be removed from me. Because when I stand before Him, I'll stand in His righteousness. The righteous garment that He put upon me. Oh. That verse stone, don't stumble over it. Don't stumble over it. Don't look bad at, at Adam and Eve. Because there's a lamb that died for you too. And a lamb that died for me. There was blood shed for you. And there was blood shed for me. So don't think you're anything special this morning. If you're saved, you're just on the path that's been paved out for you. The second stone. After that, I'm going to take you to the flood. The second stone. Because after the flood and the judgment of God, Noah's three sons then were put on the boat. And after the flood that succeeded there was three sons that was left Shem Ham and Japheth you see judgment had done come 
and all the people had been destroyed on the face of the earth. But these. So God put a milepost up. He put a stone down. And he said, here's how the world is going to look. He took Japheth. And his descendants all went to Europe. That's us. He took Ham. All of his descendants went to Africa. But one. And there's a message in that, and I'll preach it one day. One of Ham's sons did not go to Africa. And then there was Shem. Shem. That was the Palestine area. That was Israel. That would be the stone that God would choose to bring Jesus to us through Shem. You see, Joseph and Mary both came out of the tribe of Judah, which came out of the Shem. God has it marked out perfect, my friends. You better get on board, and you better pay attention to the milepost. We, we got a bunch in Washington, D.C. that's going to put us under a curse if you're not careful. You know who they are, don't you? And you know why we're going under a curse, don't you? Are you hearing all of this negative talk about Israel? Are you hearing the... the, the just go ahead and say it, Democrat Party is talking about cutting off funds. To Israel. We know what that is. According to the word of God. If you turn on Israel. You'll be under the curse of God. But if you support Israel. You'll be under the blessings of God. And America. In its trend going down. We need to look at the milepost. Israel is where Jesus came through. And we better not turn from Israel. That's a milepost that we better pay attention to. A stone was laid there for Seth. Or not Seth, but Shem. And from Shem, Jesus would come. Now the third stone laid would be Abraham. Abraham is what? is what? The father of the nation of Israel. The father. Because Abraham was called by God for a special work on behalf of us. And that was to establish and be the beginnings of Israel. Abraham is a very important man in the Bible because he was a man that God called and a man that God used. And then the fourth stone comes sometimes later. And that was in Egypt. When the children of Israel were there in Egypt. And there God was going to free them. And to make them a nation. And take them out. Their fourth stone is the Passover lamb. There in Egypt. The Passover lamb that God told them. said, Take a lamb without blemish. Without spot. Kill it. Put the blood over the doorpost. And a death angel would pass you by. We're traveling out the path now of time. 
We're traveling out the path that God has laid out. You see, that death angel represented Christ who died for us, who took our place. And then the fifth stone was the Israel itself. Israel became a nation in a day, the Bible says, as they marched out of Egypt. My goodness. By the way, the Passover lamb, that was a picture of grace. Did you know that? All of those that in Egypt, those, and, and by the way, if they just put the blood on the doorpost, they said, death angel won't come by. We'll see the blood and we'll pass over you. That's the grace of God. God, he sees the blood being applied to my heart. And judgment will pass over me. So the fifth one was Israel now becomes a nation. But the sixth stone is the establishment of the law at Mount Sinai. That's important. Because in Romans 2, 7, Paul said, I would have not known about sin had it not been the law. The law was designed to teach us what sin was and how weak we were. And how that we could never obey the law. But Jesus did. Number seven. The seventh stone was the birth of Christ. Oh, how important it was. The moment in time that he became flesh. Now listen to what he did. When he became flesh, he adopted the path that had been laid. He adopted the path that started in Genesis 3.15. He adopted to become the lamb that would be slain. He adopted that path. For you and I. To fulfill the promises. Of the prophecies that had been made before. To fulfill Isaiah. To fulfill the genealogy. It all is important. To fulfill the law. 